You know, all of us want to live a long life. In fact, to be at our peak physical, emotional, and intellectual performance, irrespective of your, irrespective of your age, gender, or even physical fitness is a universal human aspiration. And I would say it's also a universal human right. And I work on circadian rhythm, or the science of how our body is pre-programmed to be at our peak performance in every hour of the 24 hours day. And I really want to share the insight from circadian rhythm so that all of us can live an optimum long life. So when it comes to circadian rhythm, it relates to lifestyle. And what is lifestyle? There are a lot of stuff that goes into lifestyle. But I would say that it's what, when, and how much we eat, sleep, and move around or exercise on a daily basis. That's what his lifestyle is. And most of us, we know about what we eat and how much we eat and what kind of exercise we do and how much we do how it relates to health. But when it comes to timing, the science of circadian rhythm is very new, so that's why it's, uh, I wanted to share what is the circadian rhythm or how timing matters. So I'll give you 10 takeaway messages. So the first one is circadian rhythms are pre-programmed daily calendars of physiological events that are signs of bigger vitality and long life. So for example, those of you who didn't party too late into the night and could go to bed around 10 o'clock, then your deepest sleep happened around 2 o'clock in the morning. And anticipating waking up around an hour before waking up, your heart rate is, begins to rise, your body temperature begins to rise, and after you wake up, get a little bit of light, your melatonin level will go down, your cortisol level will begin to rise, your bowel movement is most likely in the morning, your pancreas is most active in the first half of the day, and your cognitive performance is actually peaks around this time, so that's why I asked the organizer to let me speak at this time so you can <laughs> soak up everything. And then right after this, right after the conference ends, please go and do some exercise because that's the time when our body is prepared to exercise pretty well with minimum risk for injury. And in fact, people have shown that exercising in the late afternoon is way much more beneficial, even from peak athletic performers to people with diabetes than morning exercise, although exercise at any time is much better than no exercise. And as Evening rolls in, your melatonin levels will begin to rise two to three hours before your habitual sleep time. Your body will cool down and will go back to sleep. In fact, if you think for a moment, a perfect healthy day is when all these rhythms happen at the right time. So that's why I say that a sign of long healthy life is to have these rhythms every single day at the right time. So then, how are these controlled? So the research over the last, I would say, 30, 35 years have shown that circadian rhythms are controlled by molecular circadian clocks, their clock genes, and that are present in every cell and in every organ in our body. So just like we relate circadian rhythms to brain, our brain has a clock so that we go to sleep and wake up, and when we go to sleep, it's just not a passive process. This is when our brain repairs, resets, and rejuvenates. So similarly, every organ in our body has its own clock. So these circadian rhythms boost our immune system so that a body can fight infectious disease. It accelerates recovery so that we can come back to full functionality after an injury. It optimizes brain function so that we can live at our peak emotional and intellectual health. It also boosts our, our metabolism, detoxification, DNA repair, all these repair processes so that we remain protected from wide range of diseases starting from pre-diabetes to cancer. And then the question is how are the circadian rhythms controlled or synchronized to the outside world? Because if we know those tricks, then we can manipulate our surrounding to, to nurture our circadian rhythm. So almost 20 years ago to this uh, year, in 2002, we discovered that circadian rhythms are 
synchronized with the outside world through light signals that are entirely perceived through the retina. So for example, if we take experimental animals who have no eyes or or people who have lost both eyes to surgery, they cannot control their circadian rhythm to the outside world, even though they get enough sunlight, daylight, and all kinds of light. And what we discovered was there is a small group of light sensors in the retina, and these light sensors sense mostly blue light and then trend the circadian clocks. In fact, this is called melanopsin, which is present only in 5,000 cells in each human retina, they sense blue light, and they're less sensitive to orange light or dim light. So as a result, our ancestors, when they didn't have access to electrical lighting, then evening candlelight or moonlight was not enough to activate melanopsin. So melatonin, the sleep hormone melatonin, would begin to rise at the right time, and we had our ancestors had better sleep. And during daytime, bright light, even outdoor light in a a uh, cloudy London day is enough to activate melanopsin. And that would synchronize our brain clock, increase alertness, and reduce depression. And that's the basis for why bright light actually reduces depression and increases our alertness. But the problem is, in the modern days, we spend more than 90% of our time indoor in dimly lit room like this and listening to talks <laughs> so, <laughs> or watching TV. So, and then uh, during nighttime, we're exposed to a lot of bright screen and bright light. So this disrupts our circadian rhythm because it activates melanopsin, disrupts rhythms, reduces our melatonin production, and we have poor sleep. And during daytime, as you're stuck indoor, then our melanopsin is not activated enough, it reduces alertness, and we have foggy brain. So as a result, we ping pong between insomnia at night and then foggy brain. Uh, during the day, and if it continues for weeks, months, or years, then that increases the risk for many affective disorders, starting from postpartum depression to PTSD. So that's why there is a new idea that by manipulating light during day and night, we can potentially entrain our circadian rhythm, particularly the brain circadian clocks, and reduce the risk for many of the diseases. So next, I'll switch gear and talk about food. So just imagine, in the middle of the night, if you wake up and have a healthy dose of salad. It's not healthy, actually. So, and many of you agree that, for example, if your best friend knocks on your door in the middle of your sleep, he or she may not be your best friend again. <laughs> so that's exactly what happens when we eat at the wrong time, then Instead of light controlling our body clock and brain clock, now food takes, care, takes over this regulation so that food entrains or regulates most of our body. So we have, a, we have a confusing signal, light, dark, entrains our brain clock, whereas feeding, fasting entrains our rest of the body. So now if we think about, okay, so we, we bring nutrition, sleep, and then exercise together, then how is this clock and all of these three foundations of health are related? Over the last 20 years, the field of circadian rhythm has also found that just like clocks regulate our sleep or clocks regulate when we feel hunger, hungry, or how food affects our, our sleep or circadian rhythm, there's also new insight that circadian rhythms also determine what time is good for us to exercise, and excessive exercise at the wrong time. For example, late into the night, if you exercise, you know that cortisol levels can begin to rise, and it can disrupt your sleep. So these three are reciprocally regulated with circadian clock, and they're also interrelated with each other. And as I said, all of these are under light-dark regulation. So now let's put all of this together and compare how our ancestors, who had no access to electrical lighting, had little food, how were their rhythms versus our rhythms? So our ancestral rhythms were pretty strong because they didn't have access to light, so they had complete dark night. They could sleep for eight hours or more. And then during daytime, they had plenty of light, a lot of physical activity, and opportunity to eat was limited. 
in most hunter-gatherer communities, we find that people eat maximum two, so two or maximum three meals, and all those meals are consumed during the day. But in modern days, things have changed. So circadian, then the question is, what disrupts our circadian rhythms? So there are a few things that, can, that you can relate to. For example, changes in sleep, light, or food timing can disrupt our circadian rhythm. If you have insufficient sleep, fragmented sleep, or mistimed sleep, obviously you are also exposed to light at the wrong time. And if you're eating over a long window of time, more than 12 hours at least, or you're changing your breakfast time by two hours or more, or dinner time by two hours or more, it's almost similar to getting a jet lag, and that can disrupt your circadian rhythm. So as a result, our modern rhythms are very different. We spend most of our time in dimly lit rooms, we sleep less, we have very little physical activity, and our opportunity to eat has extend, expanded. In fact, everybody is telling us that your brain cannot function unless you eat or drink something in every two to three hours. So as a result, as long as our eyes are open, our mouth is open, and that causes chronic circadian rhythm disruption. And we can encapsulate all of this into three bullet points. So for example, over the last almost 100 years, shift work of people who go back and forth between day and night shift, we know that their rhythms is so disrupted they are at a very high risk for many chronic diseases. In fact, in England, until late 19th century, women are not allowed to do shift work because they knew that shift work can disrupt uh, even uh, uh, menstrual cycle and estrous cycle in women, so it was banned for, for women. And recently, World Health Organization has actually classified certain kind of shift work as potential carcinogen. This is one lifestyle that has been clearly defined as cancer-causing. Second, those of you who fly very frequently between US and uh, Europe, at least 50 times a year, <laughs> a few times a year, actually, uh, if you have two or more hours of jet lag within a day, so that also classifies as circadian rhythm disruption. And social jet lag, those of you who spend time with friends and families and party till past midnight, that can also disrupt your circadian rhythm, and we call it social jet lag. So now the question is, well, I've been telling you about circadian rhythm affect everything, is there evidence? So what we found is that almost every hormone, every brain chemical, every digestive juice, even every gene rises and falls at certain time of the day or night. We cannot do these experiments in humans. A few years ago, we collected tissue samples from 64 different organs or brain regions, including 22 different brain regions from a non-human primate, and we looked at what time of the day which genes are rising and falling. Very simple experiment. And what we found is almost every organ we looked at, there are a certain number of genes that are rising and falling, and what you are seeing here is what time of the day, how many genes rise. Um, so for example, here are muscles. The muscle genes rise in late afternoon for baboon, who are also like humans. So the bottom line, what we found is nearly 85% of the protein coding genes in our genome may rise and fall at a certain time of the day. So that means our body is pre-programmed to do certain things at one time of the day and may go through repair and rejuvenation at another time. And second implication is almost 85% of the FDA-approved drugs or supplements that you take, they may have a peak time when the effects are much better than other time. In fact, many chemotherapies for breast cancers are shown to have much better effect in the morning than evening and vice versa. Similarly, almost all blood pressure medication taken at bedtime are way more effective in reducing cardiovascular event over, over the next five to 10 years. So similarly, we are finding, I think we are at the beginning of a big revolution where we'll find out what time of the day which medications or supplements should be taken. Another finding was just like our brain goes to sleep, it seems our genome also goes to sleep because in the middle of the night, very few genes actually reach their peak expression level 
Um, so that means as we stay awake late into the night, there is a genomic basis why our circadian rhythms may be disrupted. If we take all of these rhythms and ask, okay, what are the top pathways in our cells or in our body that are circadianly regulated, then we also find evidence that, for example, mitochondria structure and function, cellular redox, detoxification, protein folding, immune surveillance, all of these processes are circadianly regulated in at least 20 or more tissues. So that means, just imagine, if you think of any disease, anything that compromises our health, we can always connect them back to one of these 10 or 12 different very basic cellular processes. This is also another evidence that circadian rhythms can affect um, our body's resilience against disease. Then the question is, are there evidence? So living with broken circadian rhythms, will it really bring us close to common chronic disease? So for example, if you lose sleep for a few days, or if you're jet lagged for a few weeks, then it's not going to kill you. What will happen is you'll have mood swing, you might have insomnia, you'll be cranky. Uh, so these are just discomfort. And if they continue for weeks, months, or uh, even years, then starting from babies to middle-aged and older adults, the risk for many diseases go up. And this is by reviewing the last 50 years of um, medical literature, we found that shift work like lifestyle can increase the risk from more than 100 different diseases, and I listed few. And then, in controlled clinical studies where we can bring healthy humans and then disrupt their rhythms only for a week or two and measure blood biomarkers, then we also see the risk for many of the diseases go up. And then third, if we take animals and, and disrupt their circadian rhythm by deleting circadian genes or making, putting them in shift work-like lifestyle, then this disease risk, or even in some cases, the disease severity go up. If you think about it, the ones that are in red affect actually more than 10% of the population. So that means almost everybody, almost everybody in this room, you might know someone who is affected by one of these diseases. And the point is, can we reverse or better manage this by optimizing circadian clock through our behavior or clocking the drugs? So for example, giving at least the hypertensive medication in the bedtime, or even drugging the clock. We are actually developing new drugs that act directly on the clock itself. And a couple of years ago, we published a paper in Nature showing this drug that affects the clock is much more potent than the existing treatment for glioblastoma. And there are a lot of research in that area to come up with new drugs against the clock. So now, one thing is, what can you do right now, from today onwards, to to nurture your circadian rhythm. So a few years ago, almost 10 years ago to this date, actually in May 2012, we published this first paper showing what we call time-restricted eating, which is now popular as intermittent fasting, can prevent and reverse many chronic diseases. The idea is very simple, and you can relate to your own lifestyle. For example, as soon as we start eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, our body actually begins to burn fat and store, sorry, burn carb and store some fat. And after our last meal, as our body depletes carbohydrate, it starts to burn some fat. And after several hours of fasting, our body is really burning a good amount of fat, and that produces ketone bodies, and that also switches from set of circadian genes, so we go through the repair and rejuvenation process. But as soon as we eat something that has few grams of carbohydrate, then within 15 minutes, the switch flips. It takes almost 10 to 12 hours to start burning this fat to a significant extent, but within just 15 minutes of eating something that has carb, uh, this uh, switches. So now the question is, if you spread this food, the same number of calories over a long period of time, then you may not switch on this fasting-induced circadian changes. As a result, you may burn less fat. This is a very simple idea. Then the question is, well, if it is so, then we can give the same number of calories and just change the timing, and we'll see what happens. So we did this experiment almost 10 years ago that was published, 
We took two identical set of mice, we were born to the same moms with the same microbiome, with everything same, the num they ate the same number of calories from the same exact food. The only thing that changed was the first group of mice were allowed to eat any time, and the second group was trained to eat everything within eight hours in the first experiment. And within 18 weeks, what we found is the random eating mice were obese, diabetic, and had many other chronic diseases. And this experiment has been repeated at least 11,000 times because almost every metabolic lab does this experiment. They put mice on random eating paradigm and then make them obese and then give them a medication to cure them or treat them. And the second group of mice were completely healthy. Two years later, we also tested to see if we take these mice that are already obese and diabetic and put them in eight to 10 hours of eating, what happens? We can actually reverse the disease. So that was really profound at that point. Initially, nobody believed us. And <laughs> it's good that these days when I go, almost in every conference, people actually believe this um, time ratio eating or intermittent fasting. Um, but the point is, eight hours is not a magic number. You can actually do nine, even 10 hours, at least in mice, we see very similar results. Then again, we always want to go back to the go back to evidence to see what really happens in time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting. So in a recent experiment that's not published yet, I'm sharing for the first time, what we did, we took nearly 20 different, 20 plus different peripheral organs and brain regions from these mice that are eating within nine hours or eating randomly, and we did gene expression analysis, so that's more than a thousand samples, and with each sample we are measuring the expression of 22,000 genes. Um, and we asked, okay, so what are the molecular networks that mediated, mediate this? What are the mediators? And then what is the impact on organ aging? The key point is, just by changing when these mice ate, they could change the expression or when nearly 80% of the genes turned on and off or went up or down in different, different parts of the body. And what is interesting is most of these big changes happen in adipose tissues so, or fat tissues and part of the brain that regulates behavior and adrenal gland that regulates cortisol level. Um, and you can see there are digestive tissues here, duodenum and jejunum, that also respond to time eating a big way. And we have seen that the gut microbiome changes in a huge way. It makes the gut microbiome much better than any other prebiotic we have seen its effect on mice. Uh, so that's the huge impact on, uh, of time eating. And then, if we look at which genes are actually changing in multiple tissues, then what we find is the proteins that change, that are, uh, that are involved in fatty acid catabolism, fat breakdown, protein processing, lysosome, or cleaning up our uh, toxins, all of these are upregulated in time restricted eating. And then a few other things that are uh, immune response activation, so it reduces inflammation, and now we see the genetic signature that that's actually happening. Then we asked, does time restricting really improve our circadian rhythm? So these are all the cycling genes, what time of the day, the peak or trough, and what we see, time restricting actually boosts the cycling of genes in multiple different organs. So now the mice have a clear two different phases. One is when they respond to nutrient, and another clear phase when they're responding to fasting. So as we had assumed almost 10 years ago, we are finding clear signature that this is what happens. Then the question is what happens, which kind of genes are turning on at different time of the day? What we are finding is in the fasting phase, we increase the expression of autophagy, DNA repair, cell cycle, fatty acid oxidation, all of this stuff that are good for us. Um, essentially detoxification and fat burning. And when mice eat, then we also increase the production of the right kind of RNA, the right kind of proteins that are synthesized. They also fold properly so the enzymes can work properly. So now we know a lot from mice. Then the question is, how can we translate to humans? Because the potential is pretty high. And in basic research, this is how we go. We do animal studies, pilot feasibility studies, then randomized control trial, multi-location trial, and then we can develop recommendations and standard of care. But the first question is, when do people actually eat? Who can change their eating pattern? And almost 10 years ago, when we published, 
the biggest criticism we got was people don't eat like mice. But nobody had checked when people eat. So we developed a very, very simple app called My Circadian Clock, and that anyone anywhere in the world can download. But in the first instance, we limited it to 156 people who could download the app and take a picture of what they ate. So they had to open the app one click, take a picture second click, press save third click. The picture actually saved on the server, not on the phone. And every time they ate or drank something that had calorie, we put a timeline, so this is one day of record, and we had to, we collected three weeks of data because we know that what we eat or when we eat between day, weekday and weekends are very different, and also from one week to another week is very different, so you can see this person was eating or snacking almost 10, seven to 10 times a day, and the weekday and weekends are very different. If we collect the data, then you can see that person is actually going through what do you call social jet lag, waking up two to three hours later and eating in the weekend. And you might think that this person is an outlier because nobody eats like this. This is three weeks of data. And we had 156 people who were not shift workers, they were not students, and their eating pattern was very similar. As expected, they ate a little bit more during lunch and dinner, sorry, lunch and dinner time. The number of calories at lunch and dinner time was also slightly high. But the midnight snacks are actually packed with calories because we don't wake up in the middle of the night just to bite one apple and then go back to sleep. We need that big bowl of ice cream. So that's exactly what we found. And what we found is nearly 50% of adults who are not shift workers, they eat for 14 hours, 40 minutes or longer. So that's, we can say that 50% of adults eat for 15 hours or longer. Less than 10% of people actually eat consistently within a time window of less than 12 hours. When I say consistently, that's very important because you may be eating within 12 hours one day and another day you may be shifting that by two, two hours, so that's, not, that's actually going to give a very bad signal to your circadian rhythm. So now if we combine all of this, then the question is what should be our ideal circadian day? So in all of our clinical studies, we gave people six tips to improve their circadian rhythm. One, try to go to bed at a consistent time and be in bed for eight hours. If you are in bed for eight hours, then you're more likely to sleep for seven hours, which is considered healthy for most people. After waking up, wait at least for an hour before your first calorie, because that's the time when your sleep hormone melatonin is going down, stress hormone is coming up, you can think of that as the changing of the guards, and that's not the time when your that's the time when your body is not prepared to digest and absorb nutrient pretty well. So wait for an hour at least. Uh, more is better, and then have your breakfast. That is fast breaking your fast, not your morning meal. <laughs> it can be any time. Have your breakfast at a consistent time, and then eat all your calories within the next eight, nine, 10, or maximum 12 hours, not more than 12 hours. And then number four, your last calories should be two to three hours before bedtime, and you should also avoid bright light two to three hours before bedtime. So no calories, no bright light two to three hours before bedtime. Then number five, don't forget to go outside and get some daylight. At least 30 minutes of daylight, even in a cloudy day, is pretty good. And if you cannot go outside, at least have your breakfast or lunch next to a large window. And if you're next to a large window on a cloudy day, you still get 800 to 1,000 lux of light. And also don't forget to exercise because 30 minutes of brisk walking, that adds up to almost 180 minutes, 150 to 180 minutes in a week. Uh, that's always good for your health, and if you can time it to the afternoon, particularly those with pre-diabetes or diabetes, they see much better result. So these are the six simple ideas, but we emphasize mostly on time-restricted eating part. I don't know how we are doing on time, but uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> you can stop me anytime. Now. So in our Typical studies, what we do is we give the patients my circadian clock app, we put a continuous glucose monitor, we also put an active watch that measures light quality, quantity, timing, sleep, activity, everything. And um, this is how a typical eating pattern of a person looks like. Every uh, orange circle here is one eating event that has any calorie. And um, if you see the 
every day is eating event, that's how it looks like, but the person actually changes breakfast quite a few times, it means more frequently. So the bottom line is the interval within which 95% of all the eating ha event happens, we call that the eating window. So for this person it was 14 hours, and that's the wake up time and sleep time, and this person just changed eating time and did not change the sleep or um, going to bed or wake up time. And after 12 weeks, this was his, uh, this was his eating pattern. His blood glucose was pretty high, and his estimated A1C in the US, uh, it was 6.7%, 6.5 is roughly when you become diabetic. And that was his eating pattern. This is another patient who was actually eating three meals a day, and uh, the first meal was very quickly after waking up because he had to go to work, who was doing a morning shift work. And the only thing that he did was to delay that breakfast, bring the breakfast to work and have the breakfast at work. And after 12 weeks, his A1C dropped 1.6%, which is pretty substantial. Uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't drop that quickly. Uh, so this is how the change happened. So why we're super excited about this is in the US alone, 85 million people have pre-diabetes. And when a person goes from pre-diabetes to diabetes, then the annual cost of healthcare goes up by at least $9,000. So that means if we can prevent diabetes in a million people for one year, that's $9 billion saving. And I'm very confident that by doing this, at least we can delay diabetes in 10 million people for at least five to 10 years. So you do the math. So this basic science has a huge impact on, on patient care. So of course, in this study, we had metabolic syndrome patients, so that means they also had hypertension, high triglyceride, um, particularly high LDL cholesterol and low HDL cholesterol. And another thing that we find in almost all time-restricted eating studies or intermittent fasting studies is uh, we see a very significant drop in both diastolic and systolic blood pressure, which is equivalent to taking a blood pressure medication. Um, but the point is, if somebody has the condition and wants to do it, they should consult that physician. And uh, of course, they had a drop in total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol um, uh, dropped a little bit, uh, but the SDL cholesterol was not rising within 12 weeks. We don't know whether it will take longer time. So right now, there are nearly 140 different clinical trials going on to use time eating alone or in combination with medication and supplements to take care of many diseases, starting from obesity, pre-diabetes, to multiple sclerosis, cancer prehab, cancer rehab, and even certain forms of uh, memory loss. So the bottom line take home message is our circadian rhythms are actually an ancient and internal system to keep us healthy. And by erratic lifestyle, such as eating, sleeping, or exercising at the wrong time, can disrupt our circadian rhythm, bring us close to many chronic diseases, and by fixing our circadian rhythm by time eating, paying attention to light, sleep, and right exercise, we can prevent, reverse, or even manage many of the chronic disease. And thank you, have a perfect circadian day. Thank you, London. Thanks.